What is going on Swayze gang? I hope you're having a fantastic day today. In today's video, we're actually going to be talking about the Ford Bronco, as I'm sure you can tell with this beast standing behind me. The reason I wanna talk about it in today's video is because I recently passed 1,000 miles of owning this car, and believe it or not, it's already been just a little over a month and a half since I took delivery. So I thought it would be a good time to discuss some of the things I have noticed over my 1,000 miles of ownership. You could call it the good, the bad, the ugly, even though there's really not that much ugly to talk about this car, it kind of just depends on your personal opinion. So to kick it off, and in no particular order, the first thing I wanted to discuss is the gas mileage. And in order to do that, we're actually gonna jump inside of the car, and I'll let you know exactly what the car has told me the MPG has been for this vehicle. All right, so if you guys don't follow along with the channel, this is the base 2.3 liter EcoBoost four cylinder engine that produces around 300 horsepower if you use premium fuel. Now, the EPA actually rates this car at 20 in the city, 22 on the highway. And well, at 1,250 miles, my real life MPG has been 20.9 miles per gallon. That's actually pretty spot on with what the EPA rates this car. Now, to give you some background, this vehicle has been driven about 60% in the city, 40% on the highway. So almost an even mix between the two. And I'm getting pretty much right at what the EPA is rating it as the average 21 miles per gallon. Now, whether that is a good or bad figure really depends on what car you're coming from. Uh, if you guys don't know, I'm coming from a Toyota RAV4, which had, you know, on the highway upwards of 30, if not 31, 32, miles per gallon and on average I was probably getting around 25 to 26 mpg. This vehicle is definitely worse but uh, to be honest I actually expected that going into the purchase. I mean look at this thing it's pretty much a box on wheels so the aerodynamics of this car are not made to get you know 30 miles per gallon even though the engine is relatively small for a vehicle of this size. But we'll get to the engine in just a minute and talk about the horsepower. In terms of MPG I'm pretty impressed with it. Uh, for this car with how much it weighs and how it looks getting about 21 MPG is better than what a lot of people who come from V8 Broncos of the past had which meant you're probably lucky to get like 13 MPG at that point you're considered great. So 21 miles per gallon is really nothing to laugh at because for a car of this size it's really pretty impressive. Now for the second thing I wanted to discuss, it's actually the gas tank. So if you guys are not familiar, the Bronco has two different size of gas tanks depending on whether you get the four door or the two door option. My particular one is the four door, so it comes with about a 21 gallon tank, which I have been thoroughly impressed with. I was not used to that. You know, I heard that there were people that were upset that the two door has a small gas tank, but even at 17 gallons, that's larger than average for a vehicle of this size. Now, full disclosure, I am not used to the truck scene, and I know trucks typically have larger gallon tanks, maybe 20 to 30 gallons, but to me, I've been thoroughly impressed with how far I've been able to go on a single fill-up. The car usually gives me an estimate, and it's a little over 400 miles on a single fill-up. You know, I'm used to having like a 14 to 16 gallon tank in my daily driver, so having 21 gallons and being able to go much further between fill-ups has been really nice to have, especially when you're doing a longer trip like where I'm at right here, doing a little staycation that's kind of far away from home. I pretty much only went down like a quarter tank in my entire trip. So I've been impressed with that and that's something to consider when you're buying a new Bronco. Now, the next thing I wanted to discuss is the brakes. Now, funny enough, I've actually discussed this in a previous video where I talked about the five things I hate about my 2021 Ford Bronco. And one of the things I disliked was how spongy and somewhat weak uh, the brakes seem to feel until you really push down on them very hard. It's hard to get a lot of brake pressure at the very initial stages of pushing the brakes. It's just something I have to get used to, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm wanting to focus on the brake squeal. So believe it or not, at a thousand miles, I already have some little bit of brake squeak or squeal coming through the wheels as I'm applying pressure. And just so you know, that has nothing to do with the integrity of the brakes or how good or bad they are. And that has to do with a bunch of different factors. So it's very hard to narrow down exactly why brakes squeak. It could do with debris getting into the brake pads. It could do with the material the brake pads are made out of. I do park this car outside, so it may have to do with water getting on the rotors, rusting a little bit, and that causing it to squeak. But regardless, just so you know, if you own this car 40,000 miles, there's a good chance you may be hearing some brake squeak as you're applying pressure. Again, that doesn't mean the brakes are bad or going bad. It just means, well, they're actually working. So just something to notice when you're uh, driving in the streets, you may have that after a thousand 
10,000 miles of ownership, which I have not had on some of the previous cars I've owned. That can also be resolved by either cleaning the rotors or potentially replacing the existing brake pads with ceramic brake pads. Typically, ceramic does not have the same drawbacks or squeaks that you would find with regular brake pads that come from the factory. Okay, next up, like I said, in no particular order, but something a lot of people have wanted Bronco owners to address, and that is the soft top noise. Now, if you guys don't know, I made a video comparing the soft top Bronco to just a regular crossover and the difference in decibels between the two. It's really not that big of a difference, um, and it really does a better job than you would expect. But in real life experience, how is the soft top? And I'm here to tell you it's really not bad. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I have driven this car at 80 miles per hour on the highway, and I have easily been able to have a conversation with somebody else, listen to some music, and not have like a headache after my three hour journey to where I'm at at this destination in this beautiful city. It's really not something that gets on your mind or annoys you over time. The soft top has come a long way from the days of the mid 2000s Jeep Wranglers that I've driven in, um, and it really is a very good solution to get your Bronco a lot quicker than maybe the hard tops that are facing some issues over the last several months. The soft top is a way you can get your car sooner and you're really not going to regret it. Uh, there's also a lot of advantages that I've talked about having a soft top. Yesterday actually I pulled off these back panels and the one on the trunk and folded the soft top all the way down to the back. I had this cool open air experience which you can also do with the hard top but it's just not as easy and you have to store the panels in the back whereas the soft top you just unhook two things, you push a button back here and it folds all the way down. It's really useful and nice to have. And I would recommend anybody who is maybe doubtful of having the soft top is to go test drive it and really see what it's like driving on the highway. Because I guarantee you it's probably better than what you expect since you're used to maybe some older Jeep Wranglers. So that is my two cents on the topic of owning a soft top. Another thing I wanted to discuss in regards to the soft top, which is probably going to result in me taking this vehicle back to the dealership to get fixed, is yesterday as I was taking off the paneling and folding the soft top back down and up, I noticed there's a little bit of fraying, and I don't know if you could see it on camera very well, but the stitching uh, between the, the roof and the back panel has kind of started to fray, and it's my finger can actually fit inside of here, so it's not a small hole uh, by any means, and it could probably look, result in water seeping in, although it probably seep down here. I don't think it would get inside of the trunk space, but regardless, that is kind of a defect that I have noticed just recently, and I'm not sure if this was something that developed over time or something that I just missed when I took delivery of the car, but I'm definitely gonna have to get that fixed especially since I'm parking this car most of the time outside in the rain and the snow. With that, I do want to address the whistling sound. Uh, if you guys are not familiar, certain trims of the Bronco, people have reported a whistling sound coming into the cabin and it's not known exactly why it's being caused. Uh, some people say the Big Bend trim is actually more prone to that as well as a couple other trims, but not all of them have this whistling sound. Unfortunately, I do. Now, I can't say it's something that I absolutely hate. Again, it's not something that gives me a headache. It's not something that I constantly think about. I do hear some whistle noise coming in and some people are saying it has to do with the seal between the hood and the front grille of the car. Others are saying it might have to do with the side view mirrors and the way they're set up or shaped. Regardless of what it is, it's really not extremely noticeable. It's not like you have a window window open or anything like that. It's not a, a super loud sound that comes through the cabin. And I have seen reports where Ford is working on a resolution to this issue. Somewhere in the beginning of 2022, they're going to release this information to dealers so you can take your, whether it's a Big Bend or some other trim Bronco, into the dealership and they're going to fix the problem and fix the whistling sound. But also one quick thing to note about the whistle is I've noticed it with the roof on, the roof down, windows up, windows down. Like it's regardless of what state the soft top is in, you still have that whistling sound coming into the cabin, especially when you're hitting higher speeds like on the highway. That is not something that should persuade you away from getting a soft top because to me the advantages still outweigh the cons of owning a soft top Bronco. Now the next thing I wanted to talk about and uh, first off I want to apologize for how dirty this vehicle is. I took it on a little bit of a trail yesterday and got it just a little bit dirty on a slightly rocky dirty trail and because of that this car has been filthy and I haven't had a chance to wash it. But uh, the next thing I wanted to discuss about is the window snag. And what I mean by that is when I open up the door, as you can see, the window kind of snags 
on this seal over here, which is where the window pushes up against when the door is closed so that water doesn't get into the car. But what I've noticed is specifically on the passenger side for me, it snags a little bit more and this window kind of shakes when you open it, when you're kind of used to opening a door because you just pull on it. Um, it, it does shake a little bit and it does snag on this seal over here. It's not as bad on the rear door and hardly noticeable on the other doors like the drivers. I don't know if it drops down quicker or maybe the seal isn't as good as the other side or I don't know the exact causes of it. Uh, but overall, it is something that's noticeable and it's not a big deal. It's not something that I'm frustrated about. But I do wonder how it's going to hold up over time after 50, 60,000 miles. Is the alignment going to be off? Is there going to be issues with the power windows going up and down? I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure Ford would honor it in its warranty, but the question is when it's out of warranty, what's going to happen? And that's really something that people are just going to have to pay attention to over time. Another thing that I think works really well and I wanted to discuss is the keyless entry system. So as you can see here, to lock the car, you just hold this button over here. It's not even a physical button. It's just kind of a, a sensor over here, but this locks the vehicle. And then I've never had issues with it not unlocking in time. So every time I touch the door handle, it opens up, it works really well all of the time and it unlocks all four doors. And I'm sure you could change that as a setting because I know some people would prefer just to open the one door that they're looking to open for safety reasons. But I like that it opens all four doors. And the other thing I like is the trunk actually has its own sensor. So if you're just going to load some stuff into the trunk, it's really nice to not have to go and touch the driver's side door handle just to unlock the vehicle. You can just grab it from back here and the trunk open up just fine. So if that's something I've really liked. I think Ford did a really good job. And usually when you have plastic handles like these, they don't really throw these sensors on, but I like that Ford did that on this big Ben trim Bronco. The next thing I wanted to discuss is something that I'm sure a lot of you are just dying to find out. And that is how is the base 2.3 liter EcoBoost engine? You know, it's sad to say that a lot of car YouTubers and automotive journalism has painted this engine to be kind of a slug. Like you just do not want to get this one at all costs go for the 2.7 liter. And I'm here to tell you the exact opposite. I do not have firsthand experience with the 2.7 liter, but what I will say is I have had no issues with this 2.3 liter EcoBoost. It is plenty of power. I have never had any issues passing anybody on the freeway. And once you get it into the right power band, which is probably just above 3000 RPM, you have quite a bit of torque at your disposal and there's really no lag after that point. Now, I will say that when you're just starting up from like zero miles per hour to maybe 20, until you hit that three, three and a half thousand RPM, you may have a little bit of a sluggish car. But in reality, when you're on the freeway, when you're trying to pass somebody, or when you're just trying to accelerate, it's really not that bad, especially all things considered with this car being so heavy and so massive, it does a pretty good job. And um, I've driven some pretty slow engines in the past. I've had a two liter inline four non-turbocharged engine in a small Jetta, and that was pretty slow. I also own a 700 plus horsepower our Hellcat and this is from my first-hand experience this car is plenty quick there's really nothing to laugh at it does a great job it carries the weight well and it also gets better miles per gallon and chances are if you order the 2.3 liter you're gonna pay a lower price and you might get it quicker because the 2.7 liter from what I've heard is in shorter supply than this 2.3 liter so take my opinion for what it is coming from a really slow car and a really fast car this engine does a perfect job and I would without any reluctance take this 2.3 liter again knowing the amount of power that it has now if you guys are wanting something a little bit more powerful you can definitely go for the 2.7 liter but this is not an engine that should be ignored. I mean, 300 horsepower is really nothing to laugh at in any vehicle, uh, let alone an off-roader body on frame car like this. One complaint I do have is I don't get why they don't have struts that hold the hood open and I have to use this old school hood opener. Uh, it's again, not a huge complaint, but I wish that this car came with hood struts like a lot of other modern cars come with these days. Okay, next thing I wanted to discuss is the swaying on the freeway or on windy days. Now, if you guys are, are familiar with Jeep Wranglers or cars of this size, you'll know that on a boxy vehicle with pretty poor aerodynamics, you're probably gonna face quite a bit of swaying when it's uh, at highway speeds or there's a big crosswind coming your way. You know, you're gonna start wobbling on the freeway. And I'm here to report I have had zero issues with that in my over 1,000 mile and one and a half months of ownership in some pretty windy days here in Utah. This car handles just as well as I did in any other crossover I've owned. You know, if it's super windy, yes, it sways a little bit, but so do my crossovers. Uh, this car actually keeps itself planted really well 
well on the road. Now, obviously that has to do with the longer wheelbase on the four door option. If you do get the two door, I am certain you're gonna have a little bit more swaying than you do in this vehicle just because of the size and weight. But overall, I'm really impressed with how little sway I've had on this car. That was one thing I was concerned about because when I do take it on longer trips, I do take it in places that may be a little bit windy, especially when you have like this big plain area with some mountains on the edges, you get a lot of crosswinds and you just do not feel them very much in this car. The steering wheel does never jerk you one way or another. Part of that could have to do with the independent front suspension, but I'm here to tell you that this car drives just like any other crossover. And I've even had people who are more familiar with crossovers sit and drive this car and they have said the same thing. This does not handle like a big body on frame truck. It handles a lot better than you would expect. Now, the last thing I wanted to discuss in today's video is this car is hands down a huge head turner. And part of that has to do with the fact that this is such a new car and it looks totally different. I mean, this is not just your cookie cutter off-road SUV. This is very, very noticeable from the front end with my optional LED headlights, the Bronco, the color, uh, the way this thing stands, even though this is not the Sasquatch, or the super off-road version, it still sits pretty tall. And I do have some plans to change up the wheels and make it a little bit more aggressive. But even without that, this car is already a pretty menacing vehicle down the road, especially at night with those headlights shining in your rear view mirror. Every place I take this car, people are turning heads, they're asking questions. Is this the new Bronco? Oh, wow, I love your Bronco, it looks awesome. And there's no way to really fly under the radar in this vehicle. Um, I think a majority of people who see this car on the road really love how it looks. And I think the interior looks really nice as well so if you guys are an introvert you probably shouldn't be one of the early deliveries of this car because you're gonna get asked questions you know where did you get it when did you get it how much you paid for it uh, this one definitely is a conversation starter because it's such a striking looking vehicle and it's a nice refresher to all of the Wranglers that you're seeing on the road and that's really kind of its only competitor I mean all the other ones are very off-road capable SUVs but they're typically unibody construction or a body on frame but not this type of body on frame with the square look to it this really is a cool looking car and even though i've had it for a month and a half people are still asking me questions about this car especially when i take it to car shows well there you have it ladies and gentlemen i hope you enjoyed today's video i wanted to talk to you about all of the things i have noticed in my 1000 miles of ownership and there's definitely more things that i will talk about in future videos but those are just some sneak peeks of things that i've really enjoyed and things that maybe not so so much enjoyed about my ownership of this vehicle. If you guys have any questions on anything I've discussed or other things, make sure you leave them in the comments below and I'll do my best to address them in future videos. As always, make sure you find me on Instagram and TikTok at Shwayze underscore. And until next time, stay Shwayze, stay healthy, and have a wonderful day.